Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So we are going to <clears throat> continue with the process of organogenesis. And uh, so in today's lecture, we are going to cover the uh, development of eye. So last time we saw wing and the leg development. Today we are going to see development of a, uh, development of compound eye in uh, fruit flies. Um, as we discussed last time, uh, we have imaginal discs, uh, which are uh, <clears throat> determine the cells which are going to make imaginal discs. Uh, their specification already starts at uh, embryonic stage, but these uh, pouches of epithelium, they become visible uh, at larval stages. Um, here is the eye imaginal disc, for example. Uh, there are two imaginal discs uh, for eye. Uh, this upper part of imaginal disc is called is the antennal uh, imaginal uh, antennal imaginal disc, which is going to make these antenna. And this part of the imaginal disc is the eye imaginal disc which uh, develops into adult eye. So the patterning of eye imaginal disc, it takes place uh, at uh, third uh, star larval stages. Um, and last time when we were talking about development of wing and uh, leg, uh, we saw uh, that uh, it depends on the position of the imaginal disc, uh, where these imaginal discs are going to develop. Uh, for example, we specifically looked at uh, <clears throat> thoracic segment two, where uh, wing uh, imaginal disc develops and how then its patterning takes place. So based on the position uh, within anterior posterior axis of uh, of the organism, you have uh, same <clears throat> toolkit, which means by toolkit, I mean the uh, molecules or the molecular players. So DPP uh, signaling plays a role. There was wingless, notch, uh, hedgehog, uh, etc. And if you change the position, of imaginal discs, like for example, this uh, cartoon is showing. <clears throat> so the uh, fate of the imaginal disc uh, or the genes which are being expressed, for example, in thoracic segment two, they will be changed if we uh, move them on different sides. So it's a coordinated action of uh, cell signaling uh, together with the homeotic genes uh, we covered in detail the expression of homeotic genes. Uh, here, for example, it's shown if you have Haltier, and if, if you, you know, if the gene expression pattern of the homeotic genes, for example, UBX is expressed in the Haltier and is silent in the wing disc. If through genetic and molecular events, you, you interfere with the expression of uh, Haltier, uh, so the, uh, interfere with the expression of UVX, uh, the whole day development is uh, skewed and you see wing starts developing from uh, whole day when you lose the UVX. So this is what we covered last time. So today we are going to talk about the patterning of the eye development in flies. As I said in the, uh, at the start of the lecture, it's a compound eye. Uh, so you have uh, these uh, photoreceptors, uh, and each photoreceptor is called omatidia. And these uh, omatidia, they are organized uh, as hexagonal array. So there are 800 uh, such omatidia uh, here in the compound eye. And each omatidia <clears throat> basically acts as an individual eye as well. So <clears throat> Uh, I repeat, so you have, for example, here, 
these uh, photoreceptors uh, or omatidia, which uh, comprise of these eight cells. Uh, so R1, R2, R3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And then you have these cone cells. Uh, so together they are going to make one uh, omatidia. So as I just uh, told you, so omatidia is made up of eight uh, photoreceptor neurons, R1 to R8. Uh, you have uh, four cone cells uh, and they secrete the uh, lens. So the function of cone cells is uh, to make lens. And then you have eight pigmented cells. Uh, at the third instar larval stages, this patterning uh, of omatidia uh, or a material structure takes place. People uh, have the ones who are interested in eye development. Uh, I would say they you they have used omatidia uh, omaterial development uh, as a model system. So within the fly, I served as complete model system to understand uh, the genetic and molecular basis of uh, omaterial development in flies. They did genetic screens, they did, you know, uh, use the uh, genome-wide approaches, genomic approaches. Uh, latest people have used, you know, transcriptomics, etc., to understand uh, this intricate relationship between these uh, eight photoreceptor neurons and how they develop, because they develop very precisely in a uh, hierarchical manner. Uh, as the lecture proceed, you will see, you know, there is an order. The reason we name them R1, R2, 3, 4, 5, 6, this is basically uh, not only the position, but also the order in which they develop. And uh, another uh, striking phenomenon uh, we have learned through material development is the cell-cell interaction. Uh, so it's not, not the cell lineage. So here, for example, we will not see uh, in contrast to most of the lectures in development where we said, you know, cell fate determination takes place and then, you know, you develop a specific cell lineage. And in that lineage, you know, cells remember their fates. Here, uh, it's cellular in, intercellular interactions or communication among these cells. And at the uh, core of eye development is uh, two individual cells, R7 and R8. It's the communication between these two which determine or which uh, finally contributes to development of this, you know, uh, omatidia, uh, omatidium and such a perfect hexagon. Uh, array. Um, so we'll uh, see, we will learn about this, just communication between two cells. So there's no cell lineage, etc. here. So the patterning uh, actually uh, takes place at, at the uh, third instar, uh, you know, larva. It, it, it starts at the middle of the third instar larva. However, and the precursor, eye precursor cells, uh, which are uh, these um, eye measure discs, they are somehow, uh, I would say, their fate is somehow uh, determined um, at embryonic stage, because if we use ILS GAL4, uh, we do see expression uh, very early embryonic stage, which is, uh, at, at the uh, neuronal level, at the brain level, uh, towards anterior side, uh, but ILS is expressed, which is marker of uh, eye development as well. ILS is homologue of PAC6. Uh, you remember we covered in detail uh, PAC6 in our earlier lecture when we talked about cell signal. So in the imaginal disk, uh, so as I said, so this is the eye imaginal disk. Um, and the patterning, it takes starts uh, at the middle of third instar larva, and it starts 
uh, at the posterior. So this is the posterior side of the imaginal disc. This is the anterior side of the imaginal disc. And this um, patterning, um, it initiates at the posterior side, but then it progresses towards anterior. So this is the direction. And it takes nearly two days. Uh, and during this time alone, the imaginal disc, it grows eight times, which means cell division is taking place. Now, the earliest visible sign which we see is actually a, a groove which will appear here. And this is called mitotic furrow. Uh, so behind this, uh, mitotic furrow, you have cells actively dividing. Uh, and due to this rapid cell division, we see this furrow uh, rapidly moving. So it will be here and then this furrow moves. That's the only visible sign we see that, you know, uh, patterning of eye, eye formation is actually progressing. Now, if we, as I said, so behind this uh, mitotic furrow, um, so this is a zoom in. Uh, so there is a rapid cell division taking place. Uh, cells are rapidly dividing. Uh, then slightly, uh, sorry, uh, I, I was wrong. So this is the furrow. Ahead of furrow, you have uh, rapid cell division. Uh, and behind uh, the furrow, uh, you don't see cell division because here now the fates uh, are being determined. Okay. So the reason we see this uh, furrow moving from here to there, because, you know, when cells are dividing here, and as soon as cell division finishes, these cells stop, stop, stop dividing and we will see cells here dividing very fast. And we will see, all we see is actually cells which are dividing very fast. And this furrow just is basically sign of movement of this rapid, rapidly uh, dividing cells. Now, the earliest event, uh, as I said, is, is the formation of this groove. And this formation of groove uh, is actually indication of this mitotic furrow, OK? This uh, morphogenetic furrow, uh, I'm, I'm repeatedly using mitotic furrow, not mitotic furrow, morphogenetic furrow, which is actually due to mitosis. So it moves. Uh, posterior to anterior, as I already said, and it, sw it sweeps across, so it, it will go like this. And this uh, morphogenetic furrow is actually uh, in response to signals, uh, cell signaling molecules, which initiate the omatidial uh, development. Now, as we said, we have uh, rapid cell division ahead of the morphogenetic furrow. Uh, and then just behind uh, the morphogenetic furrow, uh, cells stop dividing. And there is uh, a race, there is a struggle uh, to, so out of these cells, there's a struggle. Uh, one of the cell is to attain R8 identity, okay? Um, so what determines, uh, that one of these cells uh, is going to differentiate into R8. Uh, so the photoreceptor uh, neuron eight. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, what you should also try to see that, you know, there are many cells. Um, so this is showing you that many cells, they are trying to become R8. But eventually, only one of the cell uh, succeeds in becoming R8. And 
they are actually regularly spaced. They are not, you know, so each, uh, so the one which uh, becomes successful, uh, that becomes separated and it then recruits cells around itself. So there's lateral inhibition as well here and that they are regularly spaced. We are soon going to see a molecule called Atenal, which is involved in this uh, specification of R8 and then sending messages to the rest of the cells that no one else can become R8. Uh, one of the cell which uh, has attained this status, it has already differentiated into uh, R8 cell. And that uh, then uh, sets the stage for uh, separation and, and the regular spacing pattern of omatidia. Now, if we uh, think of uh, morphogenetic furrow, so uh, morphogenetic furrow is very important during the uh, differentiation of these uh, photoreceptor uh, cells, because if the morphogenetic furrow does not move, it means uh, cell division is uh, not taking place ahead of the morphogenetic furrow. If that is not taking place, uh, eye development is abnormal and uh, eye development does not take place properly. Now, as I said, uh, you have R8 uh, behind the morphogenetic furrow. The first event is actually uh, one of these cells is trying to attain and then differentiate into R8. Once R8 is uh, differentiated, then it recruits <coughs> other cells. And the cells which are going to attain uh, or differentiate are called R2 and R5 after the R8, then we have three and four, and finally one and six. Now R7 is the last one to be differentiated. And this is the communication between seven and eight, uh, which leads to the development of seven, okay? Now we are going to talk about the molecules which are involved uh, in the, the, this, uh, a differentiation of different photoreceptor neurons and how it is taking place. Once R8 is established or once R8 is differentiated, you now it has a cluster of 20 cells around itself. And once you have uh, one R8 established, so there will be distance of you know nearly 20 cells. So that's how you achieve the regular spacing between uh, different uh, omatidia. Uh, and then you see uh, here, if you pay attention here, uh, you know, omatidium development here is complete. Uh, this is R7, R8 is complete. Uh, you know, they are getting differentiated and that's how you see uh, <clears throat> a regularly spaced structure. <clears throat> so, the genetic screens, uh, if I remember correctly, it was, uh, uh, if I remember, it was, I believe, Ernst Hoffman's lab uh, did some beautiful study about development of R7 and R8 uh, development <clears throat> and where they discovered the signaling molecules as well. So through genetics, they uh, determined different uh, molecules, different genes, which are involved in development of R7 and R8. For example, one of the mutant was called Sevenless. Uh, Sevenless as in fly, we uh, name genes after the mutant phenotype. It means the R7 didn't develop. Uh, and then R8, uh, if you have, uh, you know, a certain mutation, and we are soon going to see what that mutation is. If we have a certain mutation, genetic mutation, uh, that is responsible for differentiation of eight, seven does not develop. So that is what I, I say, uh, one of the beautiful, most beautiful examples of uh, 
cell to cell communication which just involved two cells and which uh, has key role in development of uh, eye structure in a multicellular eukaryote um, <clears throat> so in uh, eye normally we don't have anterior posterior compartment uh, in eye imaginal disc the way we have in other uh, imaginal disc okay the only anterior and posterior axis we define in uh, fly eye imaginal disc is actually due to this morphogenetic furrow okay so behind the morphogenetic furrow we term it posterior and ahead of morphogenetic furrow, furrow we uh, name that region as the anterior. Now the posterior uh, cells, so all these cells here, for example, they secrete the hedgehog uh, and you know hedgehog uh, uh, active uh, triggers the uh, DPP and then uh, as a result of uh, DPP cell signaling, uh, the cells, they become competent to become neuronal cells. In this whole process of photoreceptor development, wingless also play a crucial role in uh, fly eye development. But for example, if you will take, uh, if I try to draw, uh, fly, so the larval imaginal disc, if we stay in, let's say if we have wingless uh, leg Z, uh, or let's say, wingless gal4 cross to us leg z uh, what we see we have wingless is expressed just in this region on both sides uh, like matter and uh, what we have learned that you know uh, if there is defect in the wingless again eye uh, structure is very badly impacted now as we <clears throat> so, as we learned earlier, <clears throat> during this process of uh, omatidium differentiation, the first step we said uh, behind the uh, mor um, morphogenetic furrow is actually the specification of R8. And this R8, uh, then I told you, recruits nearly 20 cells uh, which contribute to omatidium development. However, this specification of R8 is crucial because, as I said, there is a tug of war. Each cell here wants to become R8. Uh, and then the one which becomes R8, then it, it sends signal uh, to the all neighboring cells that you know none of us, and it's a inhibition inhibitory signal to the uh, neighboring cells, and none of them then uh, try to become R8. After R8, uh, then we see specification of R2 and R5, uh, which is here, uh, followed by R3 and R4. Uh, and finally, R1 and R6, and eventually R7 is the last one I told you. Now, once you have all the uh, eight cells uh, specified, finally, there's rotation uh, of the whole omatidium uh, in such a way that R7, uh, it becomes closest to the equator, so if, for example, if we say this is the equator of the imaginal disk, now it will rotate in such a way that R7 will be closest to equator and uh, R3 will be uh, farthest away, okay? So there, there's a rotation. Now, so there is, uh, since this, due to this directionality, uh, you know that R7 is always going to be in, in a certain direction. Just like I gave you example of, you know, the hair cells uh, on the back of the fly, they're always 
pointing towards posterior side. The phenomenon we talked about was planar cell polarity. So in eye uh, omaterial development also, we have this planar cell polarity, uh, which is due to activation of result uh, in R3 and R4. Uh, do you recall what result is? What is result? Um, it's a receptor um, that activates beta ketanin, if I don't forget, I'm not forgetting it. And I think it does it in response to, I think I'm forgetting that bit, yeah. Anyone else? Nalaiko abhi midterm diya. Wentz ligand. Pardon? The wind signaling pathway. Yeah, wind signaling pathway and what it is, what's its role? The disheveled protein is usually bound to frizzled and beta catenin is degraded. So... Frizzled is a receptor or a, you know, a kinase or where it is in the wingless part. Um, frizzled is the receptor. So what determines as I said, uh, the um, R7 has to be closest to equator. I mean, that is uh, a morphological observation or anatomical observation what what defines i mean we in development we cannot say uh, you know some arbitrary events are taking place and you know your i7 has to be next to the equator there are reasons uh, and there are molecular reasons uh, so there is a molecule uh, which is called iroquois and i think we did talk about iroquois in uh, wing development as well. Uh, so this gene complex uh, is the one which actually uh, specifies the uh, equator of the eye. Uh, and that is followed by specification of equator, which involves notch, delta serrate. So these two are ligands for the notch. Uh, and fringe is also, uh, so there are three ligands for uh, notch, uh, delta, serrate, and fringe. And, uh, you know, after Iroquois gene complex, we have this notch activation. This is similar to the dorsal ventral uh, compartment specification in the wing. You remember we, we saw, uh, you know, on, on one side, we have the delta. On the other side, we have serrate. And notch activation takes place uh, here, which also leads to activation of wingless. Now, what determines or what is responsible for such regular spacing of omatidia in I? None of you asked me uh, or one thing, most fascinating thing I, when I used to read uh, papers and in particular the papers I talked about from Ernst Hafen, I was always amazed, you know, uh, if I look at the uh, eye imaginal disc stainings, <clears throat> you know, these just, one could see the clusters and then, you know, staining in R7. Uh, strainings in just R8. And that was what most fascinating thing in 20 years ago when I, 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 nearly 20 years ago when I read those papers, that through genetics, uh, scientists could dissect uh, and then pinpoint which cell is where, because they use specific cell-based markers. Uh, we, we will see soon uh, these markers. So the regular spacing, I already told you that is uh, due to the lateral inhibition. And uh, 
atrial inhibition and uh, the molecule is So this lateral inhibition already starts here when R8 starts expressing. Uh, it sends signal and then it recruits 20 cells uh, for an omatidium. And the molecule I remember is antonel. So R8 is going to express uh, antenal, and that is the first event in this lateral inhibition so that the other cells, they don't become R8. Now, <clears throat> as I said, all the cells in uh, I imaginal disc behind, behind the uh, morphogenetic furrow, uh, they are capable of so if morphogenetic furrow is passing here, moving in this direction. So any cell here uh, can become R8. As soon as uh, morphogenetic furrow passes, uh, cells try, start differentiating into R8, but only, as I told you, only one of the cell in a cluster of cells is going to become uh, R8. Uh, and once it becomes R8, it then sends inhibitory signal around three cell dia uh, region, diameter, uh, and R8 actually expresses antenal. Uh, antenal. <clears throat> <clears throat> Once R8 expresses antenal, now R8 cell, it then ex secretes, so this is the R8 now, this is going to secrete uh, scabras and uh, activate notch signaling around so that the other cells do not become R8, okay? So due to activation of antenal, <clears throat> these inhibitory signals are secreted uh, in neighboring cells. <clears throat> now, there are two crucial proteins here. So as I said, so this is actually highlighting that uh, R8 is send, sending signal. Uh, the two other crucial proteins are, uh, one is uh, EGF receptor and other is its ligand spitz. So as we learned the earlier cells, if you remember are R8 and R2 and R5. So as soon as we have these earliest uh, cells, R2, uh, R8, 2 and 5 uh, specified, they start expressing Spitz and Spitz is uh, ligand for uh, EGF receptor. This Spitz then activates the uh, EGF receptor in the neighboring cells. So two, five and eight they have activated now EGF signaling in uh, these cells, which in turn, you know, start uh, specifying uh, or and they start becoming then three, four, one, six, and eventually seven. Okay. Um, and once you have eight, two, and five specified, they express Spitz, so Spitz activate EGF uh, signaling in these cells and the cells responding to uh, EGF, uh, responding to this uh, Spitz signal and activate EGF, they are the ones which secrete Argus. Argus then you can see uh, is then diffusing away and it inhibits more distant cells uh, from being activated by Spitz because Spitz is, I mean, Spitz is not going to be just restricted to three, four, one, six, seven. 
once you have eight, two, and five sending Spitz to three and four, Spitz will go to even more distant regions. As soon as the uh, three, four, one, six, and seven uh, activate EGF, they then activate Argus, which diffuses further away to block you know, activation of uh, EGF in cells beyond uh, the, the cells which are going to contribute to this omatidia. Okay. Then the last signal what we see is, uh, and this is what I uh, have been saying since beginning of the lecture, that this is the most fascinating example of two cells communicating to each other, the seven and eight, okay? So you have eight and then R7. So the molecule, the R8 is, it expresses uh, the uh, molecule which is called BOS. Uh, and it activates uh, signaling in R7 and the receptor here is called sevenless. Uh, so if you block R8, uh, if you inhibit, you know, expression of BOS in R8, there will be no R7. And vice versa, if you have mutation in sevenless, although you have normal expression of BOS in R8, R7 will not develop. And as a, as a uh, consequence, what you have, you have, you know, uh, eight to five, then we have, uh, eight to five, and I think uh, then we have three and four. Uh, yeah, three and four and one and six. Let me go back. Two and five, three and four. I have to draw a bit bigger. So eight, two, five, three, four, one, six, and then here is the space cell which is going to be seven. Now imagine uh, seven does not get specified uh, due to. Uh, Delta boss or delta sevenless. Although uh, cells are there, it doesn't mean cells died. Cells are there, but they are not, uh, you know, spe and the, the cell is not being specified as seven. So seven is missing. As a result, what is going to happen? You have complete, almost, almost complete omatidium. Just seven is missing and the whole, so if this is the eye of wild type, the mutant eye will be smaller sized. The uh, omaterial structure is irregular uh, and you see a very clear eye phenotype just due to lack of communication between two uh, cells. Boss is, I believe boss is called uh, the full name is bride of sevenless, bride of sevenless. Uh, can someone Google and see uh, if I am uh, telling you the right uh, name for boss? Anyone? Can you see what boss? I believe it is. Uh, I it's correct. It's bride of sevenless. Then sevenless yes. is a receptor here. Uh, then there were also, I believe, uh, 
it's a whole family because they discovered then uh, other components of this whole communication. So with that, I believe I'm, I'm uh, done with the eye development. Uh, it was a short lecture. From next lecture, uh, we'll have Dr. Schweb. Uh, and I will be with you in recitation parts, okay? So Schweb is going to cover the lectures and I will cover the I will be with you in recitations. Um, today is Thursday. And our next recitation is Thursday 6. Uh, yeah, I think it's 7th or so, which, whichever date it will be. Uh, recitation ka time kya tha? 6 se 7 tha na? 6.30. 6.30. So both Ahmad and myself will be in recitations. Uh, while Shweb will be covering lectures. And I'll finally uh, share papers because the pre-mid, I wanted to cover tools as much as possible. And I think we have covered everything. Uh, I'm happy we did this because normally I give that as a big assignment for the students to do it at their own. But just due to this online semester, I, I thought it's better. I cover them so that you don't have much difficulty in the midterm and in the exams. Okay, I wish you good luck for the rest of the course. And I look forward to see you in the recitation. Uh, expect to receive papers. So in the recitation part, I'm going to send you the research papers, which were these uh, seminal research papers in the field of development. Please read every detail there, how they have done experiment, you know, experimental procedure, you should know. Also read very carefully their results. So you should know how they are explaining their results in the figures. So read figures and their figure legends. You should know what is in, for example, figure 3A or 3B or 3C, et cetera. Clear? So because you are going to lead the discussion uh, in the research paper uh, sessions, in the, uh, in the recitation. It's not me. So you are going to lead uh, the discussion. I'm going to just ask you questions. Explain me figure 3 or explain me figure 4. And you have to then explain the experiment, how they have achieved the results. Okay, is it clear? Sir. Okay. Have a good day. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz, sir. Allah, sir.